I was born in 1961, so I'm a young boomer. When I became a full-time college teacher in 1993, the first year students at the college were born around 1975. They were from what I call the computer generation, more commonly referred to with the rather meaningless name Gen X. As I'm making this video in 2020, I'm teaching first year college students who were born around 2002. They're from the cloud generation, or more commonly called Gen Z. When I started teaching, the difference between how I grew up and how my students grew up wasn't all that different. It was clear that we were from different generations, but there was a lot of similarity. The generation entering college today is much more different from late boomers like myself. Even if you're a Gen X or computer generation person, you still didn't grow up with anything like the technology kids are growing up with today. This video is an application of the information in the first videos, the first three videos in this series, an application to the realities of college teaching. This video summarizes my speculations. We're midstream in this generational transition. We don't have answers, but we do have speculations and questions to wrestle with. I'm hoping this video will help spark some useful discussion. I'm going to consider technology-related differences in generations, the four hallmarks of late moderns, and quickly the three hallmarks of emerging adults, all of which were talked about in earlier videos. When I joined a college faculty in 1993, the internet was a brand new thing. During my first years as a professor, a graphic user interface software was developed called a web browser, and the internet began to host something called the World Wide Web. Things have changed that much. Now, our students today live in a reality where they can use free cloud services to write their papers and make their presentations, where apps like Facebook and GroupMe provide ways to be in touch with friends and family all the time. Students use storage spaces like Google Drive and Dropbox regularly. There are many new platforms and apps that change the way students understand learning and understand interacting with others. It's the Wild West for anyone trying to figure out the reality students live in. This is fundamentally changing the way the students think, write, and create. Some of our current students learned to interface with a digital device like an iPhone before they learned to speak. They are literally having their brain shaped by screen-based interfaces before it's shaped by the symbol universe of words in the way that older generations experienced. This is a circumstance that has prompted statements of concern from the medical community. For our teaching today, we need to be aware of how apps and cloud computing are the reality students live in. Apps like Slack and Discord provide spaces where collaboration is practiced in different ways than professors are used to. Streaming apps like Twitch, Mixer, YouTube uh, change how students perceive interaction with content and others. They're going to hear us. <laughs> That's right. Mm. Good work. This is a recording of two streamers on a live stream. You can see the two visual presentations of them playing the game, and you can hear them talking as they play the game. So can anyone who tunes in. To the right, you can see the chat for one of them where people can real time have a discussion about what's happening in the match. And streaming now includes real time channels for music performance, fashion advice, and lots of other things, not just games. For example, Right now, in January of 2020, I've recently been interested in some activities in the U.S. Congress, but I don't have a television in my office. No problem. I watched the proceedings through a streaming platform. So what does this mean for teaching today? Well, I can't even begin to answer that question. But we all need to be asking, what does this do to us? Imagine what your teaching would look like if some of it was done through a streaming platform. Imagine what your office hours would look like if you did it through a streaming platform. Are blended classrooms of the future going to take advantage of this technology? Well, here's a bigger issue, real time. Our students have instant access to all the information we used to make them memorize, and even more information that we can't control or curate. For example, I teach a course called Contemporary Social Issues. There's a current contentious issue in the news that involves a country called Ukraine. Should I have my students memorize a world map and demonstrate that information on a test? Should I send them to the encyclopedia in the library and test their knowledge about Ukraine? Nope. I tell the students to make use of the information at their fingertips. We should use our phones real time in the classroom to bring information to bear. For younger generations, it's as easy as breathing. You simply go online to look at the appropriate app available from the Google set of apps, 
In this case, we choose Google Maps. We put in Ukraine and voila, we see where Ukraine is. We close the information panel and then we can see Ukraine relative to what countries are around it and where it is in the geography of Europe. We can get rid of the Mercator projection because that would be good. And we can see how it relates to other countries and other continents in its place on the globe. Now, we need to know more about Ukraine. So we could open that information panel and get the same thing. Or we could just type in Wikipedia, Ukraine, and we go and we look. Of course, Wikipedia isn't perfect. It's an online encyclopedia. But, you know, the other old style encyclopedias weren't perfect either. And this one has substantially more information, probably, on most topics than the old style did. And it has a lot more topics covered. It isn't peer review. It's not a journal. But it is an encyclopedia that consistently has proven to have some merit. In fact, when you get to the bottom, you look at the sources. And what kind of sources do you find? International Monetary Fund, World Bank, Human Development Indicators, World Factbook, United Nations Stats Division. These are the same sources I'd always recommend. We all realize that this information introduces new risks. We've gone away from the problems of one centralized access to information, but now we have information from dozens of sources, and the problem is discernment. For this example, I'm going to use YouTube. Not because it's better or worse than anywhere else, it just is an example. You type in Ukraine, and you get a whole variety of news sources as your starting selections. Maybe not what you were hoping for for your classes, depending on whether you wanted to look at some very different uh, constructed views. Now, you could also type in engineering. And there are engineering sources on YouTube channels that I actually subscribe to and watch fairly regularly. Some of them are actually pretty solid. Some of them not so much. What about music theory? No, I'm not talking about music theory for grad school. I'm talking about an 18-year-old or a 19-year-old and what they might learn about the basics of music theory. Or what if we went ahead and put in sociology? There's a crash course, like there are crash courses on many things. They have some strengths and some weaknesses. You get the idea. It's about discernment. Well, technology change is just the tip of the iceberg. We don't have time to look more at this. You get the idea. There are bigger concerns for teachers working across the generational divide today, though. Let's look at the hallmarks of late moderns. First, late moderns prioritize self-expressive individualism higher than early moderns do. This means students will be more likely to care about their voice, the way they speak and see, than trusted methodological techniques. And they'll want their learning environment to be relevant to them in their own self-expressive understanding of who they are. For them, a demonstration of authentic learning might not primarily be just matters of learned skills, but instead, expressions of personal engagement with reality. The goal of education in their thinking is not to guide them into what is known and trusted. The goal is to pre present what is known and trusted to connect with them as varied individuals. <laughs> now, an honest reaction for those of us juggling the workloads of teaching might be to say, look, they can do this my way or they can fail. I'm not here to cater to their self-indulgent sense of entitlement. But here's the problem. It might not be self-indulgent. For late moderns, this is the natural way to make sense of reality. This is continual change, extensive pluralism, and the thorny issues of inequality lived out in their way of being. The second hallmark is a different perspective on the legitimacy of authority. Students today have less inherent respect for people who have authority based on their position in some hierarchy. Instead, they grant authority to people who are authentic in a particular way, those who are validated by their perspective on social identity groups. I mean something more here than just political tribes. We've seen far-right conservative students and far-left progressive students dismiss or attack professors for quite some time now. These students live more of their life through the interconnected reality of the internet than any previous generation. The people who they see as their people mixes together and cross-cuts many older social grouping mechanisms. There seem to be people scattered about physically who are coalescing around social philosophies they experience online. And they grant more authority to you as a professor based on your respect for and relevance to the amorphous set of identity groups that exist. You don't have to agree with their identity group, you have to be aware of this reality. If you just assert that you're the professor, they'll easily find a variety of views from other experts with credentials equal to yours. A teacher can, learn on their, can lean on their power over the students 
their control of the student's grades, but they won't believe you possess legitimate authority. They'll just believe you have power from an organizational position. I can only suggest this. When you interact with your students, look for clues about the new typology within which they perceive their identity. Sometimes the ones we grew up with will be fine, sometimes they won't. In the second video, I said that late moderns use a multi-directional probability logic rather than a linear logic. Now, I don't mean syllogistic reasoning here. I'm talking about the other common use of the word logic, a way of organizing and understanding that combines elements in a reasoned way. For example, when you look at a computer program's code and you sort out how the programming works, you see the logic of the program. It might follow a strictly linear arrangement, but it probably won't. Programs aren't usually linear the way industrial machines were. You see, students today aren't trapped in the linear assumptions that developed most of the curriculum we use. Can we use different pedagogical approaches that allow students to make connections in different ways than the linear flow we all learned? A student trying to understand statistics, for example, can engage with the topic conceptually in the ideational of it, mathematically in the formulaic version of it, or practically as a set of tools. And they can move back and forth through these different kinds of engagement with statistics in any interdirectional way that works for them. But the textbook only allows the student to move through the learning process in one lockstep way. Can some subject matter have three topics that can be learned in any order at Tier 1? Then they can move on to Tier 2, where there are several that have to be learned before they can move on to Tier 3 and so forth? Do contemporary tools allow us to start building classrooms that let students organize information and concepts that way? Not really, but could they? What if each student had eight learning modules to complete and for each received a micro-certification? a le legitimate certification of, uh, of ability. And then they did a comprehensive synthesis that put all those pieces together and got a macro certification. That approach does exist outside of colleges. Now these are just some of the questions introduced by a multi-directional probabilistic orientation. The fourth hallmark of late moderns is non-absolutist approaches to truth. This is important for educators because facts and truth are at the heart of what we do. Now let's be careful what we say here. Students don't doubt there are facts, but they suspect many sources, including many professors, cherry-pick the facts that they report. And the students generally believe in truth, including absolute truths, but they aren't as sure experts know what these truths are. Even if the experts are well-intended and trying to minimize their biases, they're still going to have the usual human problems. They're not omniscient, and they make mistakes. So we can't assume as teachers that the students will necessarily accept what we teach as uncontested. While there's not enough time to explain everything to the students and the undergraduates, frankly, aren't advanced enough to understand it if we did, we need to consistently demonstrate how we get to particular conclusions. Demonstrations of intellectual reasoning and discernment are key, not conclusions about absolutes. Standing in front and making declarations with no demonstration that you're familiar with the basis of other views presents you as partisan. Some students are more likely to learn if we're upfront that there are multiple views and help them to discern between the views rather than repeat what we tell them. For now, a quick look should be added about emerging adulthood. In the third video, I described some relationship differences our students have because they're emerging adults. While there might not be a direct connection between my course or yours and the students' solutions to their friendship needs or their sexual desires, the way emerging adults choose to solve those life stage relationship realities might be illustrative of their solutions to their life situations in general. Um, they have roughly a decade of time when they take adult freedom as a right, but see no reason to accept major social expectations like marriage or having children that might limit or bound those freedoms. Settling down, being permanently committed to a career, a person, a church, you know, getting concerned about paying taxes. These are things they'll look at when they become early adults, but not now. This stage of life doesn't have the strong defining relationships with parents or spouse that other stages of life before and after emerging adulthood do. So we need to understand the new way friendship networks operate and see if this tells us something about how they learn. Does any of this affect the ways they approach you as a, as a professor? Does mentoring mean something different now than it used to? I have no idea. It does seem likely that these new, more consequential friendship groups and the casual disregard for sexual relationships as anything more than physical pleasure would affect what they're like when they're sitting in the classroom. 
But I can only point out that the terrain is shifting under us. I don't actually have any maps for it. A second hallmark of emerging adulthood is the life stage uh, shift to consumerism as a way of demonstrating identity rather than success. Conspicuous consumption is a term that was used to differentiate success. And now consumerism is used as an identity. This is a problem for our, our, us as teachers because when students are focused on what they consume, it limits the possibilities of the educational environment. When students perceive themselves as the agent of consumption, it limits their willingness to engage in self-development guided by someone more knowledgeable than them. Perhaps they'll be less focused on growing and becoming because they're more focused on consuming, a more passive expression of self. On the other hand, most of the research on emerging adults shows that they are interested in meaning and purpose. Now, and that provides a real opportunity for education to become a pathway to greater meaning and identity, and so supersede the consumer identity that they have. If we can just move them away from consumption and passivity toward engagement to gain their own meaning and purpose, we might be able to leverage learning. Finally, emerging adults are disengaged from organizational embeddedness. They don't care about where they fit into the system, any system. They define themselves as college students and they know that puts them in a larger social organizational system, but that isn't an important identity for them. Older generations look at where they plug in and define themselves by their positions. Emerging adults don't. Being a college student then is not a position in an organization meant to prepare them for positions in other organizations later. It's just where they are as they live out this part of the story of their lives. This probably affects their views of what a major is. They probably tend to not care as much about being a biologist or sociologist as being who they are and doing sociology or doing biology. They want to be employable at graduation, but college isn't part of a career path. It's part of a life stage dedicated to exploring personal identity, and this life stage will extend to about age 30. So, anyone wanting to teach college students in this time of generational change and difference will have to wrestle with changed generational paradigms because of technology, increased orientations towards self-expressive individualism, different ways of determining the legitimacy of authority, more multi-directional probabilistic reasoning, more tentative approaches to truth, shifts in relationship practices, a different approach to consumerism, and less willingness to be plugged into organizational systems. Some say the younger generations are failing because they don't do things the way we did when we were young. In reality, they're more in touch with the future than older generations are. Whatever that future is going to be like, wherever it takes us, we're going to need some robust discussions about late modern emerging adults. And I'm hopeful that this presentation can be a useful contribution to that process.